So I am ready to go. Yep. Very serious group. Good evening, everybody, and welcome uh, to the sixth, if you can believe it, feature in our Geography of Hope series. Um, for those of you that do not know me, my name is Monica Shear, and I am the Outreach Director here at Alaska Wilderness League and am coming to you from Southeast Pennsylvania, the traditional territories of the Susquehannock and the Lenape people. I am going to be starting the program here in just a minute. Uh, we have a number of folks that are joining us. Um, so stick with me and I will start here shortly. Great, and as I am scrolling, I am seeing so many familiar names and faces, and it takes me back to just a few short weeks ago, the first week in May, when we started the Geography of Hope series as a way to really bring people together and create a sense of community and spend some time, albeit virtually, in many of the areas throughout Alaska that we all care so passionately about. Um, this, this, excuse me, this past week, uh, we've seen the world shift again and uh, a much older pandemic and one of systematic racism is once again spotlighted. Addressing the reality of our country's enormous failings in the areas of race relations and equality is challenging and while it would be easy for us to duck responsibility and stay in our lane of wilderness and public lands protection, we cannot. There comes a time when silence is to be complicit with racism and oppression. Alaska Wilderness League is committed to protecting our public lands and waters and to ensuring that everyone, regardless of race, religion, or sexual orientation, is free to enjoy outdoor spaces until Black Americans feel safe in their own homes, their cars, or on a city sidewalk, realizing the equality in the outdoors will also remain elusive. As we work to support our partners and our allies who are on the front line, we also continue to work towards our mission of galvanizing support to secure 
vital policies that protect and defend Alaska's public lands and waters. Which brings me back to hope, which started us all off on this journey six weeks ago. Yesterday, a U.S. District Court judge in Alaska threw out the Trump administration's attempt to allow an expensive and environmentally devastating road through the heart of the Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge. This is the second time in just over a year that the <laughs> department's land trade was and part of a long history of efforts to open up this remote area to private interests. And tonight, as David takes us to the Arctic Ocean and the Arctic Refuge, well, we still have a ways to go. Please remember the efforts, the wins, and the work it took to allow us to still be here in a position to save these and other special places. So I just wanted to say a heartfelt thank you to all of you for keeping the hope and joining us tonight for a very special trip to the Arctic by land and sea. And now I would like to introduce my colleague, Leah Donahue, who is our legislative director here at Alaska Wilderness League to share some recent good news and the current lay of the land for our Arctic Ocean and Arctic Refuge campaigns. Thanks, Monica. And I'm uh, extremely excited to be here tonight also with, with David Thorison, who I've personally uh, seen give great presentations and his story um, about why he's passionate about these issues, I think is uh, a real testament to how important Alaska and, and the Arctic uh, are to people across the country. So um, just a little bit about me. I uh, have been with Alaska Wilderness League for about 10 years and I lead up our, our, our federal advocacy work uh, here in Washington, D.C. Um, I like to show you an image of Alaska because I am so uh, bummed not to be able to go there anytime soon. The picture behind me was a photo I took uh, at Mendenhall Glacier, uh, which if you haven't been, is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Um, this picture was taken midday in February. Um, and, uh, you know, all of Alaska is just uh, one of the most special places I've ever been. Um, I grew up in Southern California. Uh, my parents instilled in me the importance of protecting public lands um, and really listening to uh, local people and, and learning from them. So, you know, I, I've definitely gone on a journey um, in the work that Alaska Wilderness League has done, like many of you, uh, to protect the Arctic Ocean. Um, it, it was so exciting uh, seeing where we started uh, to coming to a point at the end of the Obama administration to see hundreds of millions of acres uh, protected in the Arctic Ocean. Um, but we, there's no way that that would have happened without all the support and work that, that you all have done to support us uh, over the years and what people across the country really did um, to stop uh, future drilling in the Arctic Ocean. So just to you know, kind of take us back a little bit, and David will will talk about the values as well. But um, I've traveled to the Arctic Ocean, um, so I want to tell you a little bit about my my experience. Um, I was fortunate enough to go up there uh, before Shell made an attempt to go to the Arctic Ocean, um, and I saw grizzly bears running on the tundra. I saw thousands of belugas swimming underneath our plane in an area known as Kasipik Lagoon. And belugas and many different whale species migrate uh, to this area every year. I also saw a lot of receding ice and it really, um, you know, as someone that grew up on the coast of California, um, just seeing an ice-free Arctic Ocean was, was really amazing to me. And, and I grew up near oil rigs and I just couldn't imagine those being off the coast of Alaska. Um, that's just a few of the species. I did not see polar bears running on the tundra, although I easily could have, uh, along with walrus, seals, and, and the, the myriad of bird species that inhabit the Arctic Ocean. Um, so a little bit of just quick history. Um, under the Bush administration, nearly 5 million acres were, were sold off to oil companies. That was uh, basically sold off the entire Arctic Ocean. Shell and many companies were the ones that, that tried to push to drill uh, in the Arctic Ocean. Fortunately, we have an incredible team of lawyers that tried to stop Shell uh, every step of the way. Um, and Shell had just a myriad of different issues 
uh, which, which really resulted in one of the, uh, you might remember back in uh, 2015, when one of their ships uh, was so uh, run badly that it, that it went aground in Southern Alaska on its way up to the Arctic. Uh, Shell spent billions of dollars to try and prove that the drilling in the Arctic Ocean was, was the right decision, and they had to pull out. And I would say that a, a big part of the reason they had to pull out was because of all the public uh, pressure. So they stopped drilling, they relinquished all their leases, and that resulted in several companies, almost all the companies, um, following suit. Um, and, you know, just a few weeks ago, um, we learned that another company, uh, the Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, relinquished their leases. And that basically cleaned the slate of all the leases that were sold uh, under the Bush administration. And if you couple that with what the Trump administration has done since, since, uh, since they've come in, uh, you might remember right when President Obama, before he left office, he made one of the biggest protection uh, uh, decisions, I would say, of his presidency and protected hundreds of millions of acres in the Arctic Ocean by saying that they would not um, be available for leasing any future leasing. Um, that is a pretty significant level of protection for any president, but was, was, was really a huge victory, I would say, for the Arctic. Um, unfortunately, Trump tried to roll all that back. He's trying to hold lease sales in the Arctic Ocean. Um, we've won already one legal victory, and our lawyers are actually gonna be back in court this week to continue to fight that since the government appealed it. Um, but it is a, a real story as to why it is so important that people go to the polls this November. If Trump continues to stay in office, we will see him continue to try and sell this area off to the oil industry, even under the current fiscal crisis. And knowing um, that oil companies like want to bail out at the same time. So um, this is an area we just cannot allow um, them to take us back and try and sell it off again. Um, similar goes onshore. I mean, the Arctic Refuge, as you all know and, and have followed, um, you know, after Congress mandated that leasing happen in the Arctic Refuge, um, you know, we've been pushing back really hard to stop that while the Trump administration steamrolls and keeps saying that they are going to hold a lease sale this year. Uh, but the great news there, as well as the good news that more companies are pulling out of the Arctic Ocean, is just like the corporate pressure we did on Shell, which we all know worked, um, banks are really stepping up and saying, look, we're making a fiscal decision here, but it's the right decision, not just for our bottom lines, but in, in our fight uh, to deal with climate change. And so Bank of America is the last major holdout in the United States, and we really need them to also take a step in the right direction. It'll put a real clear sign um, to the Trump administration that there is not going to be financing to hold these projects. And uh, you'll be getting an email likely in the morning saying, please call Bank of America. We hope you join in this fight, especially if you're a member of Bank of America. Um, we do think they will succumb to public pressure. And so we could use all, everybody's help to continue uh, to do what we can to protect the Arctic Refuge uh, while we celebrate you know, the important work of the Arctic Ocean. So thank you. Thank you, Leah. Um, and now just a few housekeeping items so you um, all are aware of how you can interact and engage with us during David's presentation. Uh, there is a chat box down below. Uh, Lois Norgard, my wonderful colleague here at Alaska Wilderness League is monitoring that. She'll be sharing some links in the chat box for additional resources. You can reference at any time. We'll also be sure to include them in the follow-up email. If you would like to make sure you're seeing uh, my lovely face as I talk as large as you can, in your upper left, right hand corner, uh, there's an option to either do speaker or gallery view. Uh, speaker just has, um, puts the speaker in the center. Gallery view allows you to see all your other uh, uh, fan, fans and friends of Alaska Wilderness League. Um, and if you have any questions at any time throughout the presentation, please feel free to type them in the chat. I'm going to be doing a Q&A with David following his, um, his talk, and we will be sure to get them uh, all to him so he can answer and engage um, at that point. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you 
the reason you're all here tonight, uh, David Thorson, um, an adventurer, a photographer, a sailor, really someone uh, that can do all the things uh, I cannot, absolutely. Um, but some of his amazing adventures um, include circumnavigating the North and South American continents. Um, and then what we're really gonna see here tonight is um, how his two trips through the Northwest Passage uh, allowed David to become the only American sail sailor to ever navigate the Northwest Passage in both directions. And the time between the trips uh, really helped to illustrate some of the climate change effects and impacts that he saw firsthand. Uh, David has also gotten to spend some time in the Arctic Refuge, um, so really is bringing to us both land and sea. And David and I had the opportunity to spend about a week together <laughs> across uh, the very exciting New Jersey uh, as we brought his story and pictures uh, to folks there. And so um, having gotten to see these, I know what a treat you're all in for. And so with that, I would like to turn it over uh, and welcome David. Thank you very much for that uh, nice introduction and, and your great thoughts. Um, uh, really, those, those were such um, great thoughts for our times that we're living through right now. And thank you, Leah, for that really great summary of all the great work that's going on um, in conservation right now in, in Alaska and the Arctic and, and really so many places right now. It gives me a lot of hope in these times that um, we're all being very passionate um, about what our concerns are in the world, even though many of us are cooped up at home and working on local issues, which I think is very important right now. It, it's kind of, you know, cliche. I know the, uh, you know, think, think globally and act locally, but there's never been a better time to really get involved locally in uh, conservation efforts right now within your community and, and in your neighborhoods, really. Uh, whether it's through watershed work, uh, water quality issues, whatever it may be, um, and keep the dreams alive, you know, keep the big picture alive of, of what we're really trying to fight for that you both summed up so well that uh, we're all passionate about. I know that everybody that's watching this evening is very passionate about the environment, and this is really a time when we have to think about how we want to reemerge into the world and to apply um, our hopes and dreams and hopefully start implementing the types of sustainable um, practices that can make this world a better place, whether it's through social justice, um, environmental justice, or um, what have you. But we need to keep, keep those dreams alive and be ready to reemerge stronger, um, more organized, and, and better than ever. So uh, with that, I'm going to take you on a bit of an environmental adventure tonight and and uh, it's just a fun, it's a fun story because I'm from Iowa. A lot of people call me the accidental explorer because I ended up growing up on a, on a glacial lake in Northwest Iowa and learning to sail and then taking that dream out, out into the oceans. And that's kind of the story that I'm going to tell you. I didn't really plan on this career. It was something that it just happened. I just kept kind of pushing myself into new boundaries and new places and um, eventually have ended up sailing about 70,000 miles around the planet now over the course of the last almost 30 years now. So I'll uh, begin by sharing the uh, screen and we will hope that the technology works. And uh, Okay, now what just happened? says I'm screen sharing, yep. but you don't have, have my program. Uh, it looks like it's just behind the Zoom. Oh, yeah. Got go. it. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and let's go to, there we go. So I've been really fortunate to um, have three um, very interesting and historic voyages into the Arctic Ocean. Um, two from the eastern side, one from the western side, and I'm going to share some of those stories tonight, but I'll, I'll just start with a, a little bit of background for you because it's kind of interesting 
um, not only in how I got there, but also in what we're living through right now, because I think that, um, I think I can advance a slide. Let me go this way. There we go. Okay, so as um, you all know, we're kind of living in two worlds right now. And although I was very inspired by what just happened with the SpaceX launch, um, I also realized that, you know, we have a bunch of billionaires that really are trying to leave the planet right now instead of maybe focusing on um, solving some of the problems here on planet Earth. And so we have these two worlds of, of um, sort of hope with people wanting to leave um, for whatever reasons, I'm not sure. And then also um, what's going on here right now with systemic racism and, and um, inequality. And we're really in this battle right now for the preservation of the planet and civil society right now. And this inequality and, and um, systemic racism is really something that is bothering us all right now and combined with coronavirus, I think is um, causing people a lot of despair. But I think in this time, as I mentioned earlier, it's really important for us to keep these dreams alive because all of us want to make the world a better place. And so we need to reemerge from this stronger, you know, and with stubborn optimism. And that's what I'm trying to stay focused on is to keep stubbornly optimistic that we can keep working toward a better world that's a healing world. And that has to do a lot with conservation practices. Um, I was really bummed out. I was going to do a lot of Earth Day celebration things and speaking uh, this year, and I love being around people. And um, I just threw in one sort of Earth Day slide that I was going to use because I was really born into this era of the race for space and the creation of Earth Day. I was a young boy then, and I was so impressed with um, seeing the Earth from outer space that it really moved me, I think, toward a life of conservation. And as Elon Musk and a lot of folks are thinking about the next world and some planet B that's out there, um, it's really true that we only have this one world and it's a place that's very, very vulnerable. And that was shown 50 years ago, obviously, when Earth Day began, but it's now gone from vulnerable to threatened. And that's why it's just so important that we continue these efforts that Alaska Wilderness League and so many other uh, groups and so many of us are, are working on trying to be positive about um, because both the earth and humans now have a virus. We have a fever and we have to move this forward into positive solutions and implement them. And one of the things that's happened during coronavirus, obviously, is that we've seen how the earth can begin healing itself just with less human action, less burning of fossil fuels, um, people all over the world are seeing things out their windows and backyards that they haven't seen in decades. And this is a really important lesson for us. A lot of people have been talking about how do we implement these positive changes in sustainable practices? And can we possibly take a pause? Well, the coronavirus has proven the point that yes, we can pause as a people. And possibly when we reemerge, we can implement new policies that are more beneficial to conservation and sustainability across the planet. That's a good lesson for all of us. Um, and again, I think these are science-based policies, and this is one of my favorite quotes. You know, the good thing about science is, is that it doesn't really matter what you think about it, right? We're all seeing this right now. Science is going to lead us um, to the truth and to um, our way out of this mess. I'm, I'm uh, convinced of this. And I've worked with a lot of scientists, as many of you have, and uh, I'm convinced that this is our way forward with science-based policies. Now, I threw in this slide because I just wanted to show you how close I was to the space program. My um, father was not the astronaut, but he was the Marine Corps helicopter pilot that um, helped develop the, the um, retrieval technology to pick up the capsules once they landed in the ocean when we were living in California when I was a boy. And so uh, instead of uh, growing up in California and having the opportunity to be on the uh, ocean where, where I was born, my family moved back to the Midwest coast of Iowa. And uh, a lot of people don't really think there's water here, but I live in the area called the Iowa Great Lakes. And it's a beautiful uh, glacial lakes region, very similar to where Lois 
uh, lives up there in the Twin Cities area with beautiful glacial lakes and really the southernmost extent of the glacial lakes in, uh, in the country. And this is where recreation rules and this is where I grew up sailing, learning to sail and I've been racing sailboats now for over 50 years and I'm very passionate about the water and this is where my water quality advocacy and really ad advocacy for the environment for conservation and wild places really began. Um, it's a place that I grew to be a, a photographer and really learned to start document, documenting the outdoors and to share beautiful pictures of the outdoors and imagery with groups and conservation groups that were in desperate need of imagery to try to help their cause. And it's something that I still do to this day. And to try to capture families, healthy outdoors, people, um, especially in this time that we live in, um, right now with coronavirus, we're finding out exactly how important healthy outdoor areas are for our families and for people to be out in to help us recover from this uh, horrible situation that we're going through right now. So this is Okaboji, of course, beautiful sailing. Um, we we're supposed to have the Inland National Championships of, uh, of the United States here this summer at Lake Okaboji in Northwest Iowa, which um, uh, we don't know is going to happen or not. So that's something I'm, uh, I'm still hoping for, but I think it doesn't look too probable at this point. And we have wonderful migrating waterfowl that go through here, hundreds and hundreds of species of birds that I love to get out and photograph. So this is kind of a magical area that I started um, my career in photography, really the environmental advocacy and sailing. And these are the things that ended up allowing me to follow my dream to the ocean. And of course, this is what we're all trying to create, both um, helping, create a, helping to create a healthy legacy for all future generations. And that's what I work at locally. And that's what I'm talking about with this hope, is that um, it's very hopeful to me to work locally right now on conservation issues and keep this big, big dream alive of protecting wilderness like the Arctic Ocean and the Arctic Refuge and so many special areas right now. And I'm so fired up to get back out, uh, hopefully traveling again and going back to these areas and creating more awareness. So how did this all start? Well, we still race these little sailboats that I grew up sailing, young kids, teenagers, and you know, eight, nine, 10 year olds race these little X boats. And I grew up sailing these things. and. This is how I grew up sailing with my mom, who was a sailor and a water quality advocate, just like my grandfather was. And it's the water that led me to my activism. Um, I don't know where all your people are viewing on the side is, but on the stern of my sailboat, um, it says help upside down. And that was the name of my little boat that I sailed at Okaboji back and forth across the lake and uh, started racing when I was a little boy. So. How does one become an expedition sailor when you grow up in Northwest Iowa? So this is the question I get most uh, when I go out and speak. And um, I guess I had a dream to do it, but growing up in Iowa, you have to have that, you know, you have to have the means to get to the ocean. And so it really came easy to me um, because I met my mentor, Roger Swanson, who is a Minnesota hog farmer and uh, happened to be one of the most decorated sailors um, of the last century in uh, American sailing history. Uh, he's passed away now, unfortunately, but not before sailing over 200,000 miles around the planet and um, really mentoring me uh, as a young buck who had never spent any time on the ocean really whatsoever, just really sailing these Midwestern lakes with a dream to go sailing. And I met him up on his farm, I interviewed him, and then he interviewed me, and off we went, um, sailing the world's oceans for a couple decades together on his beautiful boat named Cloud Nine. Uh, this was on an Atlantic crossing from South Africa when I first started with him 20, 29 years ago, almost three decades ago now. Um, just getting out there, I loved it. I don't get seasick. I have really good Iowa sea legs growing up here in the Midwest coast. So everything worked out great there. And we spent all these wonderful times together because I wanted to go to the extreme edges of the world and explore. And fortunately, so did Roger. Um, he sailed to Antarctica a couple of times and he sailed to the Arctic um, twice, uh, three times. And I was with him on two of those expeditions. 
And so Roger really introduced me to these uh, cold weather systems and the climate systems and weather. Uh, and really, uh, I, I embraced that and wanted to learn more about it. And studying the weather systems when out on the ocean is what really led me into the climate issue that I'm so active in now. Of course, sailing to Antarctica, we saw our first icebergs. Uh, um, this was all the way back in 1992 when we sailed farther south than any other private American sailboat had ever gone before um, with tremendous storms that we barely survived and sailing to Palmer Station where I first started um, working with scientists and really seeing how they worked in the field in remote places and I decided that this is something that I wanted to do for the rest of my life was explore, work with scientists and try to translate and communicate the uh, technical information that they were producing into sort of the layperson's language that could help communicate awareness about protection. And so we were down here at Palmer Station in, in the bay there, and we hadn't even finished in our Antarctica voyage. And already Roger was talking about sailing to the North Polar region and to the Northwest Passage. So in 1994, um, we decided we would position the boat in Nova Scotia, and we would attempt the Northwest Passage. And uh, no American sailboat in history had ever done the east to west historical route that Raoul Amundsen had done, and Roger wanted to attempt that. So you can see on the right side of your screen on the map, you can see where Raoul Amundsen came, came from Europe in um, 1903 and spent three years going through the Northwest Passage, and we wanted to follow his route or at least attempt to. So we we met his route and intersected off the tip of Greenland there and then sailed north across the Arctic Circle and then would cross Baffin Bay into the Northwest Passage. And if we could proceed, we would go all the way over the top of North America through the Bering Strait and then through the Aleutian Islands and hopefully into the Pacific Ocean. So that was the dream that we had. That was our goal. And we set sail, of course, cold weather sailing, something I love uh, growing, growing up in the Midwest. And uh, this is kind of amazing because we have thunderstorm and lightning on right now and storm warnings. So this is kind of perfect timing. So if I cut out, it's because we got hit by lightning or something. Uh, so cold weather is something I just love and embrace. And although it's very dangerous, it's also uh, very rewarding because it's hard work to get to these places as a team. Um, but once you get there, it's absolutely beautiful, stopping in little villages in Greenland like Kupernovik, where you can meet local people and see how they live and get introduced to their culture, language, um, how they hunt and gather food, and just how they live in these remote places. And that's what we were doing in 1994. We crossed Baffin Bay and into the Northwest Passage, and this is where it really begins in, in uh, the Arctic Ocean in Canada. And so we sailed into Lancaster Sound and into Erebus Bay. Uh, we were join, joined by one other little French boat at the time named Back of the Moon. And so in 1994, there were exactly two boats and nine people in the entire world attempting the Northwest Passage. More people summit Mount Everest every season than have sailed through the Northwest Passage in its entire history. So this area is where the first graves of the Franklin Expedition um, the three, three crew members died, the first of 129 men from that expedition who would perish. And really the, the kind of history and the um, odds of what we were up against to get through the passage sort of became very real to us. And it became even more real as we continued to get stuck in the ice um, over the course of the next uh, two to three weeks, we battled ice we were stuck uh, everywhere. We were separated from our friend, French friends on the other boat. We were almost crushed a number of times and we barely escaped with our lives. And um, we decided that the only way that we were going to get out of there was retreat uh, the 3,000 miles back out of the Northwest Passage the same way we came back in and ended up um, uh, sailing around the tip of Greenland then and um, over to Ireland, actually. We followed a hurricane across the North Atlantic and just a uh, screaming um, sail all the way across the North Atlantic into uh, Cork Harbor in Ireland. And that sort of ended our Northwest Passage in 1994 and has happened so many times with others to the Northwest Passage had won again. The ice uh, had defeated us. 
But think back to Northwest, uh, or think back to 1994, and the information that we had at the time was pretty primitive based on a lot of historical documentation, things that we were reading about. Um, the internet was pretty primitive at the time, and we didn't have the types of satellite communication that was available to us now. So 13 years pass, and in 2007, uh, we decided to return to the Northwest Passage again. And I had been studying ice charts um, and had access to a lot more information now with the internet and a lot of the information being available to the public now from many of the institutions worldwide. And I was starting to see what scientists were seeing was a tremendous loss of ice in the Arctic, this um, Arctic ice death spiral that so many people are talking about. And it looked like the Northwest Passage might be open. Roger and I talked a lot about it. He was now 75 years old. And he said, you know what? I want to give it one last shot. This is going to be the last hurrah for me. So in 2007, we took off for the Northwest Passage again. And so back we went up the west coast of Greenland, the exact same route, stopping in these beautiful little places like Sisimiut, just over the uh, Arctic Circle. Again, getting local knowledge from fishermen about ice conditions and um, folks who are around the Danish Navy and such. And, uh, and we, we finally got to our northernmost point and there's a rock outcrop up there right off the bow of cloud nine and that's called Devil's Thumb. And it's a landmark that um, ancient mariners used to use. And oh my gosh, it sounds like we might blow away here any moment. Uh, and so at this point, the, um, the local Greenlandic people would know that this is a place that the ice traditionally splits, the pack ice does, and you can sail to the west from there over to Arctic Canada at a certain time in the summer. So from there, we departed back into the Northwest Passage and we got to exactly the same point on exactly the same day, 13 years removed from where we were stuck in the ice in 1994, and this is what we were greeted with. We were witnessing an ice-free, Arctic Ocean, and we were so profoundly moved by this that we weren't even sure um, what was happening because it looked a lot like Lake Okoboji here in Northwest Iowa, and uh, there's just open water everywhere, and the ice had completely disintegrated. We were expecting less ice, but we were not expecting um, little to no ice in the Northwest Passage. So we kept going. Um, we had a lot of uh, days like this, what we called the halcyon days of summer with 24-hour um, light, um, very little wind, big high pressure, and uh, just no ice anywhere to be found. And so we proceeded uh, through the Northwest Passage, 6,694 miles, and never touched one piece of ice uh, in the process through this voyage in 2007. Um, we had a uh, Wall, Street Wall Street Journal reporter with us for some time, and we ended up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, something that hasn't been done since above the fold on a climate change story and about what was happening in the Arctic at the time. We were a little piece of mobile data that people started looking at, and my blog went viral, and um, we became a little piece of climate data that people started talking about. Um, we had some rough sailing. This is one of my uh, beautiful photos that I took that really captures the, the uh, can you hear the thunder? Is that coming through? We're having lightning bolts all around us right now. Um, and so this is one of my favorite photos of the Arctic Ocean that I took of, you know, 15 foot seas running, about 35 knots of wind, um, you know, small craft advisories off the coast of Alaska, just a perfect day for sailing. And uh, so we were sailing fast, hauling the mail, as we say, and we rounded um, Point Barrow and started sailing south, got to, uh, got to the Bering Strait, you know, crossed the Arctic Circle, and guess what? Um, we accomplished the Northwest Passage and became the first American vessel in history to ever do so. But I really think we should have an asterisk, uh, asterisk by our name because um, we really got an assist from a changing climate, a warming Arctic, and uh, we didn't really realize how much at the time we we now know the data um, through the satellite records and everything else, and all the data that's been compiled. And of course, this is the pattern that we're seeing now with tremendous changes in Arctic temperatures, um, 
we're seeing tremendous losses of ice, especially in the Bering and Chukchi Seas right now, which is making these um, small indigenous communities up there um, very, very vulnerable to uh, food insecurity issues, especially in and just treacherous hunting and fishing expeditions right now into uh, rough seas that are not buffered by any sea ice anymore. And uh, this is happening in all seasons right now. And unpredictability um, is the greatest factor up in the north right now where um, local people just are not sure whether they can find food or not. Um, this is a, a graph that I use a lot. It shows our 1994 voyage our 2007 voyage and where we sort of are in this downward trajectory of sea ice. I personally witnessed in 13 years a 40% loss of ice to our northern polar ice cap. This is outside of any natural, um, uh, any natural system that we've seen in the last uh, million years. Uh, it's, it's really something that is so historic and I often say that we're, you know, we're a, a very, very small cycle within a very long cycle. And it's a really easy way to talk about climate right now in, the, in that if you eliminate all the other factors, um, our human actions are causing the dramatic change in the climate. And of course, this is what the local people are facing there. Uh, this is 1994, you can see the Northern polar ice cap. This is at the end of the melt season. So this would be in September. Okay, and you can see the northern polar ice cap is pretty pretty big still and full of a lot of older ice. And this is in 2012. We set the record in 2007 when I was there. That was one of the first big tipping points. In 2012, um, there's a tremendous loss of sea ice and a tremendous loss of old ice, which is the big problem right now. Um, there's a lot of first year ice and very little old ice left in the um, Arctic Ocean and it's more susceptible to seasonal melting and as more ice melts it exposes more dark ocean. More dark ocean warms just as the land masses do which melts more ice. So this is the positive feedback loop that scientists talk about of the Arctic uh, death spiral with the ice. So after that expedition I just jumped right back in and 2009 and 10 I joined a circumnavigation of the two continents um, where we would be doing a lot of science for 400 days out at sea with, uh, with NASA and NOAA and MIT and working um, closely with the University of Washington, Washington and their applied physics lab. So we had a fully decked out um, research vessel. So we were citizen scientists and we had um, real um, scientists with us also from NOAA, uh, oceanographers and different scientists studying different parts of the ocean. We would sail 28,000 miles starting in Seattle and then doing a clockwise circumnavigation of the two continents from Pacific Ocean through the Northwest Passage again, um, all through the Atlantic and back to Seattle. Um, and of course, we'd be doing a lot, lots of education with, um, with, with kids. We had a whole children's program with the National Science Foundation. Uh, we'd be doing climate change work. Obviously, we were doing Arctic uh, buoy launchings and retrievals, uh, lots of wildlife and remote sensing, and um, lots of instrumentation that if you have further questions about it, I'd be happy to answer later. Um, and the main thing was we were trying to educate kids and inspire them and give them hope um, also that they could develop careers as educators and scientists working on um, creating awareness for future generations and creating this more sustainable world that we, uh, that we all hope for. So we, we talked to thousands and thousands of kids in both hemispheres and 13 different countries. And of course, we went back to the Northwest Passage. And this is in Barrow, uh, Utkiagdik uh, now, and we were out with the uh, scientists and local hunters uh, looking at the bowhead whales and their migratory route and it was just magical to be right near the bowhead whales as they were surfacing and learn about their endangered migratory route with potential oil and gas development in the um, in the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. And so much of that, the Alaska Wilderness League has been um, tremendously important on, on protecting. So again, 
uh, questions later, be happy to answer. We spent time with scientists like, um, like George Devoki, ornithologist in uh, Alaska on a barrier island named Cooper Island, where he's studying a little black guillemot and he's been there all by himself for over 40 years living in this little tent and then the shack, bear proof shack. And he's been studying this little bird now. And the small bird, uh, which has been the only source of his research there, um, just really focused on the black guillemot, has taught him about climate change, something that he didn't understand at all when he first ventured there. But he started noticing that the bird was having a longer breeding season. And uh, he wondered about the signal that the bird was picking up that he wasn't. And now he's found that the longer breeding season corresponds perfectly with the earlier melting of the sea ice um, along the shore of uh, Arctic Alaska. So um, oftentimes animals will pick up signals um, uh, that we don't as humans. And so we can learn a lot just by animal behavior and lessons uh, from, from them and signals that we're not attuned to. Um, down the road in Tuk Toyuk Tuk, um, got to spend some time with some native hunters and fishermen who were um, just finishing up their catch for the season and smoking their fish and taking them to the ice house um, 30 feet down under in the permafrost where they would store their traditionally um, caught food, uh, whether it's whale or, or fish, like the uh, white fish that the fisherman was just um, cleaning up there. So I got to go down to the ice cave and sit in the, uh, uh, one of the 19 rooms and listen to oral histories from, from my friend there. And um, it was just fascinating to listen to hundreds, hundreds of years of history that um, they were talking about in Tuktoyaktuk and how about the Arctic is just so connected with the people of the North, which are just so beautiful and uh, un unbelievable to spend time with as many of you have gotten the opportunity to do. Um, we spent time with other explorers like these two Brits who were in a 17 foot open boat trying to do the Northwest Passage. Kev and Tony who were on break from the uh, war in Afghanistan and they decided to spend a couple of years in a small boat going through the Northwest Passage. And it's 27 degrees there and they're in flip flops and sandals and they just had an encounter with a bear on shore and they were just having a jolly good time going through the Northwest Passage. And these are the characters that you meet when you uh, venture into the far north. Of course, we just kept kind of pushing on through. We were looking for weather windows, calm weather where we could motor instead of sail, so any little bits of pack ice weren't um, being tossed about in rough seas at us. But for the most part, we didn't have any problem going through the Northwest Passage again. Of course, we got to see um, healthy bears in their natural environment on ice flows in the Arctic, which was one of my big goals all along. And uh, we got to witness these two magnificent bears, mother and probably a two-year-old cub or so. Um, and uh, got up close and personal with them. They were pretty in inquisitive and so were we, and uh, got some beautiful pictures of them. And that's really what um, I, you know, that's what took me out in the first place was the beauty of the planet as a photographer. And we have to keep this in mind with all of the trouble that's going on in the world right now, that we live on this absolutely beautiful planet with so much to share, so much to see, and so much to learn. And we all want to keep this intact for future generations to have the same experiences that I've had the opportunities to go witness. Um, and this is the beauty that I just can't get enough of, whether it's ice flows in the Arctic um, or magnificent icebergs um, out in Baffin Bay near Greenland. This is what keeps taking me out into the ocean and into these wild places um, to try to share the awareness of the beauty of this planet and uh, my hope for the preservation of these wilderness areas for future generations, um, like here. And of course, with digital photography now, you can shoot in the middle of the night, like here on a moving vessel with a 300 millimeter lens and still capture images, which is something that's really fun now. I also wish I would have had the drones that I have now to take some of these uh, gorgeous images back at the time, but that'll be another journey. Um, but the sailing was beautiful. Again, we sailed the Northwest Passage, this time from west to east, and we popped on through and ventured out into Baffin Bay and down to Davis Strait, and once again crossed the Arctic Circle, and it dawned on me 
uh, at the time that that um, I had just completed the Northwest Passage in both directions and became the first American sailor to do so. And I, I was so profoundly changed and moved by this that, you know, like a small town boy from Iowa from the middle of the country could actually do something like this. And it just showed me how much the world has changed. It demonstrated to me that we're living in a changed world where accessibility to these polar areas is getting um, much more easy. And I also was thinking and writing in my journal at the time that I had actually witnessed the end of the golden age of exploration, sort of like Amundsen's era had come to a close. And this new era of exploration involved, involving the study and change of the Earth's climate systems was just beginning. We're in this very early stage. And now we have enough knowledge to act and to begin to implement these positive changes. And the only disappointment I had through all of my sailing journeys was that I didn't get to stop and, you know, like stretch my sea legs out on the land in the Arctic refuge because it's very hard to get there because coastal Arctic Alaska is shallow. It's hard to sail into. And we had a nine foot draft uh, both times with both sailboats. And we actually went aground in Shishmaref when we were trying to get in there to do some documentary work uh, in this community that's having to move because of climate change. And so we did not want to venture into um, some of these coastal places. So um, I kept my dream alive and uh, in 2018 ventured to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge with uh, some members of the Alaska Wilderness League, which was a tremendous experience for me because many of, of you all have been there numerous times. So it was nice to be there with all the experience. And um, of course, I don't need to go into a, a lot of the detail here, but um, right where that sort of red line is there where the coastal plain begins, um, that's where we were basically camped uh, in, in Sunset Pass. 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle and sort of right where the coastal plain begins, we could actually see Kaktovik uh, um, off in the distance as we hiked out um, where the mountains kind of peter out into the plain. And it was just a magnificent time there. Of course, we flew, flew in by bush plain through the Brooks Range and can over the Canyon River Valley and these tremendous landscapes and I have to tell you, you know, the Arctic Refuge, as it turns out, is not a blank white slate. You know, it really isn't. Um, as some people would have you believe, it's um, the most spectacular place I've ever been in my life. And I was so moved uh, flying in by Bush Plain. We, we spent eight days in uh, camped out there. We set up base camp. There were seven of us in our group. And each day we would go hike out into the mountains the caribou would be migrating to and fro the coastal plain on both sides of us. Grizzly bears were running uh, wild. We had 19 grizzly bears um, in and around our camp, and those are just the ones that we could count. Um, and one was, uh, a couple were trying to come right into my tent one evening, which was pretty interesting. Uh, this was a drone picture I took of our, of our remote camp that was set up. So this is Sunset Pass. And this is looking back toward the uh, Brooks Range, so looking south from there. Um, little stream running, running right there where we could get water. And the caribou would literally were migrating, thousands of them. We must have seen 10,000 caribou. I'm not kidding. And it all happened all around the summer solstice. It was just absolutely magical. So um, this is an image that I took of the caribou. Um, uh, this was happening every day through the fog, through the rain, through all kinds of conditions. And this historic migration looked exactly how it's looked for thousands and thousands of years. And I have to say, it was maybe one of the most wonderful and moving experiences that I've ever seen in my life to be around the caribou and be witnessing it with fellow conservationists and, and friends there in the Arctic. Of course, uh, I don't know, can you see on the right the the small uh, young caribou that was just birthed there. And um, you can see sort of the coastal plain shimmering there in the background uh, was absolutely spectacular to see all the caribou, big herds moving um, all around us. And of course, when there's big herds, there's Arctic wolves that roll in um, following also the migration drives the whole ecosystem in, in the far north. 
as we know, and uh, Arctic wolves are part of that. I'd never had any experience with wolves in the Arctic. You know, they're, they're running around too much on the ocean. And uh, so I wasn't really uh, sure what to do because I was out there with my, uh, by myself at this point. And I had uh, three world wolves cir circling around me. And so I just kind of did what, um, what our guide had told us. Uh, at some point, I just stood up and got big because they were moving in closer and, and just, you know, giving you that stare that just kind of scares the crap out of you. And, and uh, you get the big adrenaline rush. As it turned out, it was just fine. And, you know, they move on and they continue the migration and following the caribou. And it's just part of the fun of being there. These were the two grizzlies that were heading into my tent one evening. Um, as the other uh, fellow uh, conservationists were sleeping, um, I was out shooting pictures and I was just putting my gear away and um, I heard something and turned my head and I saw these two bears crossing the creek and heading right toward my tent. And so what do you do when grizzly bears are coming right at you? First, you grab your camera and rip off a couple pictures as you can. And then you stand up and just get as big as you can and start talking to them. And, and they stop and look at you and they don't see well and see the stick figure and then they turn and, and run away. So um, it just is a big adrenaline rush. And again, just one of the great experiences of being out there. Um, we were right amongst the bears and the caribou at the same time and the wolves. Um, Tom Campion was over uh, in another valley um, at the same time with another group. And I think they saw 17 grizzly bears. So between um, our two groups, we saw three dozen grizzly bears, which was kind of amazing. And this bear was um, right at a fresh kill site. So we were watching this bear as it had just feasted um, and eyeballing its next <laughs> potential next meal, I guess. But it was just so moving to be around uh, this entire ecosystem that was constantly changing and moving around you. Um, I I was involved at the time in a project with the International League of Conservation Photographers and um, Peter Mather. And so I was invited back to uh, the Canadian side, um, uh, to the town of Old Crow, which some of you might be familiar with. That's where the uh, Vuntu Gwich'in community is. And so I was embedded in the community then uh, for um, another eight to 10 days. And I was going to go out and document their hunting, their fall hunting of the caribou. And so I met up with another photographer there and we went out um, with, with some hunters. But unfortunately, as happened the last three years, the caribou uh, were not showing up around Old Crow on their traditional migratory route. So as we start looking at the threats to the indigenous villages of the north surrounding the refuge, um, they're threatened by climate change, which is affecting my migratory routes now and their food supplies, and also by the threat of uh, potential um, oil and drilling. So this dual threat that they're facing is, um, it's very real. We didn't see any caribou, so I got an opportunity to do a lot of oral histories, recording and videos, which was a um, very moving experience for me. The river was just freezing up. We went up and down the Porcupine River, uh, looking for caribou, going to hunting caps, um, again, um, sort of documenting what was going on around the village as they were catching um, fish for their uh, sled dogs and laying down food for the season. It was still a wonderful experience. Unfortunately, no caribou. And um, this is what I'm finding when I'm talking with uh, Arctic villagers all across um, different communities now is that elders are really struggling to pass on information now because of the unpredictability of the changing climate system in the far north. And it's making their communities, their people, their culture, very vulnerable, both because of this dual threat that they're facing with climate and with exploration. And of course, as their food supply becomes um, unpredictable, they get forced into community stores, which are packed full of um, uh, essentially food that is um, making them food deserts. And so healthy food is um, not accessible in many of these communities now, and it's leading to all sorts of other problems as they try to adapt and change um, very quickly to this changing environment that they live in. 
So since I didn't see any caribou in Old Crow, I'm going to leave you with a couple thoughts tonight from some of my new friends um, in and around uh, Old Crow and some of the great things that they had to say. This is my friend, Paul Josie, um, who's an Old Crow counselor and hunter. Um, we were out with him a lot up and down the river. He's just a terrific uh, young human being. Um, I still hear still hear some of the elders talking about the adrenaline rush from seeing the caribou and knowing that you can provide for your family, for your people. It's a natural high that fills you with joy and excitement. And this is something that I saw with him every single day, every time he would start talking about the caribou, it's like he would just absolutely come alive and start telling these fantastic stories. And then they would all start telling the stories. And this, this sort of joy around the culture of the caribou is something that is really unexplainable um, to me not growing up in that, in that culture. And this was Mary Jane Moses. And of course, saying that it was, if there's any development in the Calvin grounds, our communities would really be devastated, right? In a very bad way. Uh, the caribou is our food, it's the main source of food. And if we don't have caribou, what options do we really have? And so there's thousands of Gwich'in people that are living there that um, are very worried about their futures. And of course, Dana Tisnatram, who I spent a lot of time with uh, up there in Old Crow, very wise young man, I'm telling you, um, really summed it up right here. If we can't come together over this, if climate change can't bring us together to fulfill the dreams of our ancestors, then we have no business being on this planet anymore. And that's the seriousness of what we're facing right now. So we're faced with um, this virus of uh, humans and climate change and also coronavirus, which is showing us that we have to have science-based policies to get ourselves out um, of these situations that we're in to implement the type of hope and change that we would like to see. And through that, I hope that we can come out of this mess that we're in right now into a new era where we can actually implement these types of changes protect the most beautiful and vulnerable places that we all would like to and uh, work together to create this better and more hopeful world. And with that, I'm very uh, thankful for spending this time with you this evening and uh, sharing some stories. And I hope that uh, I've taken you away into some hopes and dreams of your own. And, uh, and I hope we can do this some other time again in the future. So. Thank you all from Alaska Wilderness League and all of you that are working so hard on your own conservation uh, issues and projects and being very good citizens in this time. So thank you all very much. And I'd be happy to answer a few questions if you have any. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, David. I did see a few come up in the chat, which is wonderful. I would encourage folks, if you do have some questions, uh, please type them in right now. Uh, quickly, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Chris, with Alaska Wilderness League to just share a little bit more about our work and how you can get involved. And then we'll be back to do Q&A. Okay. Awesome. Thank, thanks, Monica. And thank you so much, David, for, for sharing uh, these incredible images uh, with us. I, I have not had a chance to, to sort of see you speak and present. I know a number of my colleagues have, and you, uh, I was happy to see a number of them on the line. I'm very thrilled to have experienced that and so happy that so many people could join us for this. Um, I did want to just touch base about a couple different ways uh, about how to get di involved directly with this work that, that um, we've highlighted here tonight. And we had a chance to also hear from Leah speak about some of the successes in the Arctic Ocean that have been achieved um, through collective action, through people like you stepping up and getting involved. Um, two primary ways we'd like to highlight tonight is, is, is one is, is contribute to Alaska Wilderness League. Um, you know, the resources that you provide to the League help us day in and day out fight to preserve all wild areas of Alaska. There's a link that below we'll follow up as well with some information. Um, Please don't hesitate to reach out if you ever have questions in that regard to membership at alaskawild.org is, is always open. I'm happy, happy to respond to you. Um, another step in, in this fight is, as we've seen in the Arctic o Ocean successes, we're trying to achieve real success in the Arctic Refuge. Right now, there are five of six major financial institutions, major U.S. banks rather, that have 
taken a pledge to not drill in the Arctic in, in the Arctic refuge. And um, we're putting public pressure against Ang Bank of America. I encourage you to visit alaskawild.org slash Bank of America uh, to, to join in some call in efforts tomorrow uh, to, to hold um, them accountable for, for not taking a public stance against, it, against this. Um, in addition, make sure to follow us on social media. We've included our, our social links below. Um, as well as uh, I'd encourage folks to check out our blog where a lot of good resources are, are living into, including a lot of guest blogs, um, as well as those from, from some of our staff who've been able to join us here tonight. Um, I think aside from that, we, we are eager to have one more presentation uh, in, in this Geography of Hope series that's been announced. Um, we'll be taking folks to the Tongass next with our good friend Amy Gulick uh, and, our, and our state director in Anchorage, um, Andy Motoro. Um, encourage folks to RSVP for that. Uh, the, the, the link is now live. Uh, so we do want to make sure that people get their RSVPs in. Um, and then keep an eye out for a note from us uh, tomorrow with some resources that were highlighted throughout today, including a recording of the event. Um, if for some reason uh, you missed a slide or two or just want to revisit some of the incredible images. Thank you, Chris. And yeah, I'm very excited. I know when we did um, an Earth Day webinar for many of you, which seems uh, a lot longer ago than it was, there was a large interest in hearing about the Tongass National Forest and as one of my personal favorite places uh, in Alaska and having uh, Amy share her photos um, it will be quite special. So I hope you can join. Um, okay, so David, a few questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, one, a little bit about the time you spent on Ocean Watch and the vessel. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about, um, there's a little bit more about the science that was done and then specifically how many people, researchers and ones like yourself, as you call the citizen scientists, uh, were on the boat during the voyage. Yes, we had Doug. Uh, our boat was refit in Seattle. It's a 64 foot steel vessel that two scientists had actually been using in, um, in Mexico to, uh, to study uh, sea life down there um, in the Sea of Cortez. Uh, the boat was refit in Seattle. Um, all of the sort of things like air conditioners were all taken out for uh, more scientific instrumentation. We had through hull. 24-7 water quality and monitoring. Um, we were studying things like ocean acidification. Um, we had instrumentation to look at aerosols in the atmosphere and radiometers on our masthead. All this instrumentation was built by the Applied Physics Lab at the University of Washington. And our science curriculum was built by the Pacific Science Center in Seattle in conjunction um, with the National Science Foundation. And we decided to build a K through eight um, educational program because we just felt that um, working with kids and really trying to inspire kids to get them both down to the boat and us going into classrooms was was the best way to reach them. And literally, we would we would sail into port and we would tear off our foul weather gear and you know put on our dockside gear and throw out our banners and educational stuff, and we would start becoming a classroom. That's what we did. So um, we had 51 different port stops uh, during this time, and uh, we would go from being sailors to educators. Uh, we also had an advanced educational team that was working out ahead of us, and so they would be in place. So we would sail into port, and the team would be uh, there to meet us. Um, kids would oftentimes be on the dock waiting for us, um, and school systems, you know, we'd literally hit the dock and we would go right into schools, classrooms, universities, and then meet with scientists. Uh, we had 34 of us did the entire voyage as sailors, and there were 31 people total that were on the boat, everyone from theoretical physicists to uh, oceanographers, um, you know, to whale specialists and all sorts of people who are studying uh, very aspects of the oceans that we were sailing through at the time. And so we had different partners. For instance, we, we would go to an elementary school, for instance, and then in the afternoon, we would be um, doing science panels with um, Scripps School of Oceanography and, and having uh, those types of discussions uh, you know, over at the Birch Aquarium or something. So um, we sort of had these vast ranges of folks that we were working with. So um, oftentimes they were kind of very 
you know, like I have presentations I do with kids that are mostly just animals, which are really kind of fun for sort of K through four. And, uh, and then you'd have to really put on your thinking cap and getting into the ocean acidification discussion. So um, it, it, was, uh, it was a complex time and it was really a wonderful time to discuss um, science and try to inspire um, people to be educators and, and scientists, especially kids. Yeah, what an amazing trip. Um, having spent so much time in the ocean and one of the issues we are hearing about um, significantly over the last few years is really the issue of plastics in our ocean. So there's Absolutely. of what you have seen uh, or experienced um, in, with regards to plastics. Yeah, um, because we were doing um, our Around the Americas expedition was focused on um, coastal sailing for the most part and not passage making. Um, we were stopping along the coast in communities. We did see um, a number of sort of rivers of plastics, uh, especially in, in uh, South American waters, especially in Peru. Um, we did not get out into the North Pacific garbage patch, but we did spend time with the uh, scientists from Scripps um, and a group called Five Gyres, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, Five Gyres is num number five and G-Y-R-E-S, I think it's .org or .com, so if you want to look that up. Um, uh, I have a friend, Mary Crowley, also, who is doing amazing work, and I think I'll be spending time with her out in the Pacific Garbage Patch, uh, flying drones and working with her on some documentary photography. She's been doing tremendous work based out of San Francisco Bay Area. Um, we did see a lot of plastics, but we weren't in the gyres, uh, those five areas in um, all the oceans now, major oceans, where the plastics are accumulating, um, mostly in the northern Pacific area, but they're also now um, in the Indian Ocean, um, two areas of the Atlantic Ocean, and of course, in the South Pacific also. But uh, there's a lot of hope with that. Um, Mary's working on a project using drone technology, GPS um, technology and markers. Um, they're actually tagging ghost nets and then working with NASA and the space station and some new technology now to actually track the uh, ghost nets and how they're moving um, through the North Pacific. And sort of like in, in, a, in a sense, almost like a, a buoy uh, system to track how these ghost nets are moving to try to get further understanding of how the plastics are moving through the ocean. It's a tremendous issue and many of you probably have seen through National Geographic and such expeditions that, um, you know, 35,000 feet down in the ocean, there's now plastic. A lot of people think that the plastics are these big tarps and flip-flops and all the things that are on the surface, but as they disintegrate, um, they get suspended throughout the entire water column. And so that's creating the danger for all species of animals in the ocean all the way to the ocean floor. Um, it's a tremendous issue and especially things like the uh, plastic grocery bags that can become infused um, on um, migrating sea turtles and, and um, birds that are dive bombing to catch jellyfish. So um, tremendous issue, it's not going away. There's a lot of people working on it there's 10 major river systems that are now producing 90% of the plastics that are going into the oceans. And that's really the, you know, the areas that we need to be focused on. And having spent a significant time in the Arctic Ocean ecosystem, especially over such a range of time, um, some folks were moved by your polar bear picture and how you mentioned that that was something you had wanted to see. And we're curious if you noticed any declines or population changes. I mean, the, the ice was obviously an obvious uh, visual one, but if you saw any others with the animal populations. Um, what, what I did see um, in a couple communities was um, more polar bears swimming um, and swimming into uh, you know, communities. And so they were getting more bears entering into communities because the ice um, is too far offshore, uh, so their food supply is too far away for them to swim to, and so they're venturing um, into more land-based uh, foraging for food systems right now and ecosystems, so you're seeing more of that. 
um, for sure. Um, uh, as far as other species, um, I I think the uh, the bowhead whales are um, are pretty stable right now in numbers. Uh, I think their threat mostly is from offshore um, oil and gas development, and I think that's true of a lot of animals with. With walrus, for instance, you're seeing these big herds congregating um, and mass on shore. I think everybody has seen these um, photographs now. And that puts them in very vulnerable position with, with oil and gas development. Um, we're seeing more kind of herding of animals in small places. And uh, you think of what a spill would do. It could actually devastate an entire species. Um, so that's that's very damaging. We are seeing. Um, for instance, just in the Arctic Refuge, and you probably know the species of plants and the migration of of these different plants through the ecosystems, their their range is expanding and and moving, and that's causing changes in migratory patterns where um, plant life and lichen are um, being available in different places throughout the Arctic region at different times of the year now. So uh, like when I was up there in 2018, the caribou were not actually um, early on, they were not going to the coastal plain of Alaska. They were actually heading into uh, Canada at the time and, and knocked out of their normal migratory pattern. So I think what you're seeing and, and the coastal communities in the Bering and Chukchi Seas where people are living, um, there might be the normal times when traditionally they would be hunting and fishing but because there's no sea ice or less sea ice, the animals that would normally be there are not there at that time. So it's completely screwing up their traditional hunting and um, fishing seasons. And again, putting them in this, or the animals may not even show up, which mm -hmm. puts them in a horrible position of food insecurity. So these are the things uh, a little bit of uh, I've witnessed, mostly it's been through conversations and when I was up in uh, um, Alaska in 2018, I spent a lot of time with scientists at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, I spent over a week there almost every day with different scientists talking with them and interviewing them about what they've been seeing up there. And it confirmed many of the things that I've discussed with, with all of you this evening and you've been talking about also. Uh, quick question. There was uh, one of your first photos in the early slides, um, you were talking about uh, the kind of virus that is both impacting our planet and the human race. And there was a photo and it looked like it almost had a cross and someone was wondering what that was. Oh, um, the, the cross one, I think that might have been, oh yeah, right. Um, <laughs> now that that's an old photo. A lot of people don't know this, but I used to be a contract photographer with the National Park Service back in my early days. And so I would, I worked with script writers and I would go out and shoot images. Um, and then I would build back in the days, you know, clunk, clunk slide programs in theaters uh, <laughs> with, you know, old, old slides and projectors and uh, uh, their, for interpretation in their theaters. And so this was um, a photograph that I took down at Padre Island National Seashore a long time ago. And, um, I'm not sure if it's a deck of a ship or it's like the end of a pier that had been destroyed, but it had washed up on shore. And it, that image to me has always been so powerful because it sort of has all of the symbolism attached to it. So the, the, the cross that formed there, I think was just, um, you know, a, a great big metal piece that you would tie up a ship to, you know, or a, a boat at the end of a pier. But it appears as a cross, and it sort of symbolizes to me this sort of threat that we're facing in nature. That's what I've always seen from that, that nature is under threat from humans, and um, we we could, if um, we continue on our same trajectory, uh, we could end up extincting entire ecosystems uh, as we continue to multiply and and uh, take up most of the planet's uh, surface. So anyway, that's the image. And sorry, that was kind of a long explanation. I hope it helped. <laughs>
Perfect. And then um, one last question for you, and then I will wrap it up. There was one more in the chat that I would like to address. Um, but big picture, what's next for you? And I'm going to guess it's not me and you traversing New Jersey. So I can't wait to hear. Um, I was actually, I've been consulting with a friend out in the Bay Area. Um, I was slated to go back to the Northwest Passage this summer. Mm. And uh, so I've been preparing for that. But maybe uh, you've heard now, uh, Canada has banned all recreational traffic um, in the Northwest Passage. Mm. So at this point in time, all of the uh, indigenous communities are closed. And for good reason, um, they have zero cases right now in Nunavut of coronavirus. And um, maybe you've read some of the stories, uh, even of Old Crow. Um, there's a couple from uh, Toronto or Quebec or something that traveled 3,500 miles and hopped on a plane to try to escape coronavirus and ended up in Old Crow only to be met by uh, local officials, including my friend Paul Josie and and uh, Dana um, and the Mounties, who immediately arrested them and you know threw them into quarantine and got a plane and got them out of there. So mm -hmm. you know these communities are especially vulnerable right now to coronavirus. There are so many underlying health issues and elderly populations that um, they it would just be devastating. Um, for coronavirus to be introduced um, into the far north communities. So um, our Northwest Passage trip has been postponed probably to uh, 2021. And um, so I hope to be going, going back there again. Um, and this time uh, taking a fleet of drones and um, doing a lot of work uh, on the Arctic uh, coastlines and documenting uh, erosion effects of climate change in communities and stopping in small communities, um, many of which I've sailed by in the past and hopefully continuing to do a lot of uh, interviews and oral histories and spending time with, um, with local people, which is really um, the highlight of these travels. You know, it's one thing to photograph the beauty of the planet, but um, my favorite times are, are the times that I spend with the local um, indigenous people um, and or the scientists that are dedicated to working in the north to help uh, continue to spread uh, awareness of these challenging times that we live in. Thank you. And we will all keep our fingers crossed for you that you are able to go in 2021. Um, I think as we've seen tonight, your ability to capture the images and help share a story of what is going on um, that is often uh, way down um, with difficult and sometimes heavy science is so critical to to the work we're all trying to do and and contribute. So thank you for that, of course, and, and we look forward to more photos from you. Um, there was one question that I did want to address quickly before we oh, wrap sure. regarding um, someone asked how the threats of global climate change dovetail with the other pandemics such as coronavirus and racism that we're currently seeing. And, um, mm -hmm. and one thing that I've really been thinking about a lot over the last few days is how all of those really impact um, these frontline and minority communities so disproportionately um, exactly. with environmental justice, social justice issues. And so yeah. um, I just think that's important for us to keep in mind, understanding all of these pressures that are currently on our minority and frontline communities and doing what we can to be good partners um, and do the work that we can do and do it in a good way and elevate uh, the voices um, from those communities as well that are working so hard um, for uh, equality and changes. Um, so thank you for that question and allowing us to answer it. And yeah, thank you. Again, I just would like to say um, a big thank you to everyone who joined us tonight um, for all of those of you who donate and take action and support our efforts to really protect and preserve wild Alaska. Um, as you saw tonight, the lands and waters really are quite spectacular. And a big thank you to David again for joining us tonight um, through weather warnings, through thunderstorms. Um, I'm so glad that you were able to bring 
your story and your photos, um, which are of course stunning. And for anyone that would be interested in learning more, as um, Chris mentioned, please do check your email. We will be getting a note out. We will include links for David's resources. Um, I have this here. Uh, he has a number of books, which amazing photography. This is the one about the Ocean Watch uh, scientific voyage uh, that he did. Um, and then of course, over the horizon. And so please do check those out um, and support both his work and our work in ways that you are able. And I hope you tune in in about two weeks um, and take a trip to the Tongass with us. With that, good night and thank you everyone. Thank you all very much. I hope to see you in person someday again. I do too. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye.